For the past two weeks, the Propeller Gallery in downtown Toronto has hosted a very fine exhibition called From Standpoint to Viewpoint, The Prism of Harmony, featuring the works of Gail Dempsey, who is present with us today, Greg Hindle. Uh, thank you both for coming uh, to participate in this call. And of course, the late Dr. Kenneth G. Mills. The show was initiated and curated by Jennifer Murphy, and it was hung by Glenn Noble. In wow. a minute, I'm going to uh, introduce Jennifer, who will share a few words with us about the show. And then we'll pass the baton over to Greg and Gail, who will talk about their art, their works, uh, their experiences, and their perspectives. Jennifer will represent Kenneth Mills, with whom she had many conversations about art and life. Jennifer has also invited Glenn Noble to tell us a little bit about what went into hanging the show, which is in itself a work of creativity and artistry. So we do have a structure, um, but we also want to leave it open for your participation. We've put time aside for questions towards the end of each artist's presentation, and perhaps even again later towards the end of the show. Um, you can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand when we open the floor. So Jennifer, Jennifer Murphy, the inspiration for this show is an award-winning artist with a solo and group exhibition history in the United States, Brazil, and Canada. She has curated shows in New York and Ontario and has over 20 years of teaching experience. In 2010, Jennifer was awarded a certificate as Artist Educator Level 2 by the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. Wow. So now, Jennifer, uh, I'm passing the baton over to you. Almost. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I'm here at the Propeller Gallery, actually. There's some gallery viewers in, in the background, and um, I'm just sitting in the office here, and I'm delighted to be with you all. So I wanted to let everyone know really about the process of creating the show because it's been wonderful and it's been a team effort and many have helped and without the core, but without the core group of Greg Hindle, Sue Hindle, Gail Dempsey and Glenn Noble and um, it would never have come to pass. We first met in November 2021, COVID wow. was still around, but we mm. dared to gather. And it was a wonderful gathering. And the theme of the show emerged as we landed on the word wonder together. And we got there through speaking about music and harmony. Um, then, of course, over the months, the, the show statement and the works that we were going to present uh, emerged and at every step of the way it was collaborative and um, a real a great joy to work with this creative, encouraging and enthusiastic group. Of course, always we were supported by the Kenneth G. Mills Foundation and our thanks go out to the KGMF for that. Um, just let me check my notes here to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, um, before, of course, we gathered, there was the selection of the three artists. And I can say that that came as a gift. Um, I know through my lifelong experience of looking at and now uh, more recently experience of producing art, that it, while an artist, an art may give you something to look at, it's really what's unseen, which is the spirit or the frequency or the vibration of the, of the work that allows you to feel. And it was because of a shared spirit that these three artists were chosen. They're all 
educators or mentors, you might say. They're all musicians, and all three are have a great devotion and dedication to sharing the wonder of creativity with their communities. It was known by me that that spirit would extend, and my hope and goal of the show is to have that experience extend to as large a community as we can reach. So in a while, and shortly, you'll be able to see the works and hear uh, Greg and Gail speak about their work specifically. I'll do my best to speak about Dr. Mills's work. So I won't go into the specifics about the work now, but I did want to introduce my dear, dear friend, Glenn Noble, who has been a steadfast support throughout this. He's been a friend. <laughs> He's been, had a wonderful sense of humor. He's practical. He's been a very much a sounding board and a rock for me. And I know without him, the show would never have been hung as artfully as it was, um, as it is. Glenn is a, was awarded a degree from the uni uh, in fine arts from the University of Ontario, um, um, of Ottawa, I'm sorry, I'm... <clears throat> the University of Ottawa, where he grew up. And for five decades, he had a career in producing highly realistic uh, portrait drawings. They're fabulous. I've had the privilege, privilege of seeing them and also enjoyed a career in a Toronto as a very highly skilled framer. Uh, currently, he's enjoying doing photography, and I hope that one day soon we'll be able to see a show of Glenn's photographs. They're wonderful. So I've asked Glenn, as Katrine said, I've asked Glenn to speak a bit about hanging the show. So Glenn, I'll hand it over to you with my thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. It's uh, <clears throat> wonderful to be here. And hi to everyone. So I've titled this talk, Horizontal Meets Vertical. And as an introduction, I will start with a haiku. Standpoint and viewpoint. Art of consideration. Prism of wonder. What is standpoint as it relates to this exhibit? For me, it is a consideration of the show as a whole, mindful of discrete parts, but with an awareness of the totality of the groupings and themes presented. As you enter the gallery, the first prompting is to survey the broad landscape of the entire exhibit, and then to focus in and observe three artists' viewpoints and their interactions. As with these artists, the sensory input from my viewpoint informs my standpoint, committing me to the responsibility for my actions, the recognition that I am not separate from others or from nature, my role as a steward of the earth, and the aptitude and right to experience beauty, wonder, and gratitude. In discerning the artist's viewpoints upon consideration of a wall or area, which themes are discovered from each painting and in the relationships among the paintings? There are micro and macro aspects of nature, the bird's eye view versus the bee's eye view. There is nature on its own and nature with people. There is social commentary and the passage of time. There is the balance of the ecosystem there is color and form, as well as the artist's techniques, which specify viewpoint while in service of standpoint. A beautiful and unique prism is on display in this show. Bray Kindle, Gail Dempsey, and Kenneth G. Mills represent the facets with the placement of their paintings, encouraging the flow from one facet to another, from one direction to another, from one wall to another. Each direction evidences harmony and shows us how the joining of parts creates unity. In the propeller gallery's configuration, the challenge was to fit a maximum number of paintings 
into a limited wall space, two larger walls and four smaller walls. I have often used the salon approach, which involves groupings and vertical layouts instead of a strict horizontal line. The groupings here are symmetric and asymmetric, both capable of multi-directional consideration of viewpoints, themes, and aesthetics. Also, as an important element of the layout, Kenneth Mill's large and bold florals offer themselves as anchors from which the viewer can launch his or her visual journey. Between the two large walls, there are a total of 23 paintings, with five strong additional works displayed on the four smaller walls. The number of journeys possible, endless. At this point, I would like to thank Jennifer Murphy, Gail Dempsey and her son, Sean, Scarlett Leach and John Archep for their help in hanging the paintings and Propellers director, Tom Taylor, for his expertise in arranging the lights. In future shows, there will be other paintings on exhibit by these artists. The prism's aspect will have changed, but its standpoint and viewpoint will shine just as brightly. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Katrine, back to you. All right, I'm going to share the screen. And um, then you can see what Glenn has been talking about. And if you wish, Glenn, to make some comments as uh, I go through these, please go ahead. Um, and uh, we put these in the slideshow here so that some of you who may not have been at the show um, will have a sense of what Glenn is talking about. And this, okay. <laughs> and this wall, you can see Gail's three at the bottom, the triptych, and how the yellow in the middle one connects with Dr. Mills on either side, the yellow in the rose and the yellow in the prickly pear cactus blooms. And on the left here, the three paintings, you can see a theme of, of purples and mauves. So there's a color theme again happening there. And this was a symmetric wall. The other wall was asymmetric. <clears throat> yeah, that's the asymmetric one. But you can see how the fire, Greg's fire in the water, can jump over to Dr. Mill's orange, uh, I guess it's Lily. So that was interesting, their color and heat. Yeah. Does, does anyone have any questions? Maybe we should just um, open the floor for a second. Well, just to clarify, Glenn, uh, that uh, painting of mine is called Smoke on the Water. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. I was close, but no cigar. Well, <laughs> smoke, <laughs> fire, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Glenn, uh, very much appreciated. So I'm going to take a moment now and introduce Greg, Greg Hindle. Uh, so Greg is an honors graduate of the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. He mm. was awarded an assistantship for a graduate year of study in Florence, Italy, where he attended classes at the Accademia di Bella Arti and the British Institute of Florence. He joined the faculty of the Ontario College of Art in 1980, where he taught drawing and painting for over 25 years. He has also taught workshops for many Ontario arts organizations, including Visual Arts Mississauga, Waterloo Community Art Centre, Nielsen Park Creative Centre, and the mm -hmm. McMichael Gallery. Since 2007, Greg has led en plein air painting workshops with Muskoka Chautauqua as artist in residence. He has led painting excursions along the French River, Hudson Valley, New York, and Tuscany. Greg is artist in residence at the Gibson Cultural Center in Alliston, Ontario, 
where he paints and provides mentoring to developing artists. <coughs> Greg's artwork is included in Canadian and international collections. He has been featured in Canadian and American publications and in a coffee table book titled An Artist's and Photographer's Guide to Wild Ontario, published by Boston Mills Press. So um, we're going to do a little bit of a question and answer with Greg. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question, um, which I'm sure many have been asking. What does the title of this exhibition mean to you? Well, uh, thank you, Katrine, and uh, welcome to my Logs End studio in beautiful Hockley Valley. Such a great day to be doing this. Um, so I feel that the goal or the purpose of the art, this exhibition is to create a kind of balance. Um, this can be applied to our journey through life as well. Through art, we reflect both uh, harmony as well as the discord of our many fragments in our encounters with it. Uh, joys are balanced by tears, sac sacred silence by foolish clowning, self-esteem by humility, light by shadow, day by night, giving and getting, wisdom and innocence. Hmm. Really, in a way, it's all like passing through a prism fragmenting into all the different colors. I think the art celebrates that intuitively, and I'm excited to be part of an exhibition that examines this. Thank you, Greg. So um, I, I'm curious about what inspired you to become an artist. Well, I would say that I was a bit of a rudderless kid. Uh, I was interested in lots of things, but nah, nothing really motivated me. I did have a passion for the music of the day, though, listening to bands like the Beatles and Pink Floyd and others motivated me to play bass guitar in several bands back then. Uh, inevitably, they would break up and it seemed I would never get ahead by depending on others. In school, I would doodle and animate dramas in my head. Visual art absorbed me in that moment, much as music had, but I felt freer, no longer dependent on others to get ahead. Uh, I was accepted uh, to the Ontario College of Art in the early 70s, and it was an enticing and creative whirlwind of a place for a kid like me straight out of high school. My new passion became figure drawing, and I was awarded a postgraduate assistantship to study in Florence for a year as part of the um, college's off-campus program. It was a life-changing time for me, and I was nose close to the masters that I had only been aware of in books. I could reach back through time and understand the passion they felt putting brush to canvas to better tell their stories through the convincing reality of the scenes they created. I could lose myself in it. It filled me, and it still does. As a studio assistant to um, artist John Newman, I gained experience in teaching as well as dedication to the craft. I still try to emulate his empathy for students who want to learn. It was a pivotal experience that I shared with fellow students I met there who have remained uh, lifelong friends including my wife, Susan, who continues to inspire me in so many ways. Upon returning to Canada, I made a career of uh, painting and teaching, sharing my passion and teaching the tools needed to inspire others to better tell their own stories. Thank you, Greg. What an absolutely incredible opportunity that was given to you to go to Florence when you were so young. Absolutely. Um, can you explain the thought process that you go through in <clears throat> art? Well, generally, I want people to find their own stories in my paintings. But to have a successful narrative, I want to communicate with the viewer in three ways, using imagination, emotion, and aspiration. 
The harmonic rhythm and balance of a painting's visual composition and design elements help to tell a story or a universal language, which I call a visual Esperanto. Uh, this takes some planning. For example, my initial intuitive response to the pandemic was developed or crafted through numerous thumbnail sketches and revisions using pencil and paper before being transferred to the final painting accurately by using a grid. This left only the colors and maybe some small details to deal with. The whole process can take months to achieve from the initial concept to the finished work. There are two sides to my work that provide a kind of creative balance for me. The, the narrative situations that I invent with characters from my imagination is balanced uh, perhaps in a larger sense with uh, my more idealized landscapes to project the best of what the real world has to offer and my place within it. Everything and everyone eventually returns to nature. And I enjoy painting these landscapes inspired by the moment for a more intuitive and spontaneous response. So let's look at the, the painting last look back then, Katrine, if we can. Yeah. There we go. So this began as a plein air painting on a beautiful misty morning near my home. Well, while engrossed in the painting, I happened to look up and uh, I noticed uh, a dead bird dangling by its foot from a fishing line, snagged in a hydro wire directly above me. Uh, my mood crashed. I packed up and went home feeling down about that poor bird. It didn't deserve this fate, so close to its beautiful pond and meadow home. Well, I resolved to paint it into my picture, flying down to its heaven, brief and flying all over down to the back natural world from the mortal world that it had come from with one last glance back to us. These two different sides of my painting help to keep all my discorded fragments in a better harmonious balance. But in the end, uh, a painting must stand on its own. My stories, always come back to our relationship with nature and how we must defend it. Let's look at the, some examples from my last series uh, where I used the fool as a character. If we can uh, maybe bring those up. Uh, these represent the part in all of us that can't seem to resist the urge to take and take and take and with little thought or, re or care of the consequences. I gave my Self the challenge of picking a phrase with the word fool in it as a title, then designing a story to fit the saying. Some examples are this one, Ship of Fools. And then we have A Fool's Game. A fool's Paradise. There's Fool's Gold. And Fool's Rush In. So you can see all the titles sort of have the uh, fool in their phrase. It was really fun to, to design my way around the title. Uh, if we can go to Just Fooling Around. So Just Fooling Around is one of the more uh, recent uh, in this series. Um, this painting asks questions. Is that bird-like figure a man dressed in a bird suit? Is that a parrot dressed like a man? Can either of them fly? <laughs> Why is one dancing with a uh, fish out of water? Did they bring in their last catch in the bottom of that boat? Why is the dock littered with fuel drums? What's in those barrels? What is real here? Is, is everything a trick to fool us into the complacency of self-denial? What are the consequences for the earth, the water, the sky? 
You never know what will come out of Pandora's box once it's open, do you? Is that her in the wetsuit and flippers? It looks like she's trying to dive in, or is she just fooling us? The octopus is out of his realm. Even with his many arms, can he really hold it all together? Well, let's help so, because uh, the sun still beats down, hotter and hotter, around and around. Shortly after painting this, COVID hit. I was suddenly faced with a new dichotomy. I needed to explore our relationships with each other, how fragile they can be, and how we need to protect them. If we could look at the painting out of place, please. Thanks. This painting began in early 2021 when pandemic fears were raging. Decency and sometimes even sanity seemed to be dissolving before my eyes. I remember thinking of the old curse, may you live in interesting times. For sure, isolation was breeding extreme viewpoints. Minorities were being increasingly targeted. Politicians, intentionally and unintentionally, fueled fear and hatred of those not like us. Some began to feel that their governments were conspiring against them, and algorithms cemented their beliefs. Interesting times indeed. People were led to fear the stranger, the ones in the funny clothes. What are they thinking about? Nobody knows. We make fun of them, but still the fear grows. Do they want my car? My daughter, my son, get them before they get us. Send them back to where they came from. In describing this painting, we notice the white picket fence. It protects, or maybe more accurately, imprisons those within. They peek out with uncertainty at the homeless beggar from behind curtained windows in board and battened facades that almost resemble barred cages. These visual triggers aren't designed to be obvious, but to direct the mind's eye in a certain direction, subliminally, like an afterthought. Items like the clock further remind us of what they are enslaved by. And the welcome sign in the heart-shaped frame is ironic because it is anything but. But the haves are balanced by the have not. She is old and frail with few possessions, save her walking stick, which leans even pushes against the barrier. Ah, my awesome walking stick. It has special meaning to me and recurs in many of my more recent paintings. Anyway, this old woman in her ancient wisdom doesn't look back to those inside, but outwards to the viewer inviting us to ponder this dichotomy and maybe find our own balance between these two extremes. So Greg, you also painted this one um, looking up during that time, didn't you? Yes, I did, yeah. And uh, that was a little later, uh, the searching for a sense of balance and harmony Harmonic unity actually persisted when I painted looking up a year later in the first half of uh, 2022. <clears throat> We're now in the heights of uh, the COVID breakdown. Um, the times had become even more interesting with emergency measures invoked and the invasion of Ukraine threatening World War III and the end of everything. Many were already going down that rabbit hole of disinformation. I really almost desperately wanted to do a painting where I could find hope and address the imbalance in the world. I guess I just wanted things to start looking up again, and this is what came as a result. I chose a pleasing and hopefully uplifting palette to put a positive spin in this narrative. But there is a long concrete block wall dividing the wide expanse of format. It's more imposing than the white picket fence that it's replacing. 
but is the worker constructing or dismantling it? The same heavy blocks that make up the wall also hold down the balloons. The balloons can represent the idea of escape and freedom from earthly concerns. They also give us hope by floating over and past our differences to a higher state of being. The urban world to the left of the painting is balanced by the rural on the right. We can go down to the certainty of the earth or up to the questioning of the sky. The innocent babe in its mother's arms on one side heralds the future which is coming regardless. And it is juxtaposed with the wise elders of the ages on the other side who while grounded by experience and knowledge of the ages cuts the cord that ties them down so that they may soar above it all. Then of course there's the ever widening gulf between the natural setting and the technological realms. The silos in the painting represent not only its use on the farm but also our increasing isolation from each other enabled by the internet. The uh, answers aren't to be found on our phones. They're, some, of our, some are beginning to question their assumptions about life. My art strives for balance, but it's not always comforting. As a kid, I liked that old black and white science fiction movie in which the good guys win, but it finishes with the end, question mark. Even though there may be some resolution in my paintings, I like to leave a lingering uneasiness and an intangible unsettling sense that we can never go back. The future is never certain. But regardless of our standpoint and viewpoint, we must break down the barriers that prevent people from connecting if we're to move forward and find harmony. The COVID years have shown us our fragility, but in dissonance, there is resolution if we choose. Oh, thank you so much. Great. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to, before we move over to um, Gail Dempsey's work, uh, is does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask Greg? You can raise your hand electronically, and I'm just going to take a quick look at the chat. I don't bite. <laughs> um, so, uh Here's here's a question. Um, perhaps I can uh, ask this on behalf of. You have a hand up, Katrine. I, yes, I will ask this question. Um, you mentioned how you developed the composition of a narrative painting using drawing and grids. And for those on the call who are not artists, can you explain a bit about your working drawings and tell us what a grid is? Sure. I, I guess the, the first thing I do when I uh, respond to, to, to the world around me is come up with several thumbnail sketches, which are tiny little sketches that are done um, in a framed format so that I can get ideas of verticals or horizontals, which kind of format I want to use, and how to design within the rectangle. Um, once I pick one that I'm happy with, then I'll make a full tonal drawing um, of that image, I flesh it out, so to speak. So I'm solving all my problems in black and white uh, in on pencil and paper. And from that, I'll take a, a grid, a, physically just grid the paper in squares and do the same thing on my painted panel. And so it's a, a simple process then of just copying each square onto a larger surface. So after that, then I've really solved all the major problems. It's kind of an old fashioned way of doing it, but I feel more comfortable doing that way because uh, it's changeable as uh, through the process. I can keep 
I can keep uh, improving it as as it goes from one stage to the next. So I think changes are happening right through to the very end of the painting, frankly, but uh, hopefully nothing uh, too drastic that uh, I have to rework too much. All right, thank you, Greg. Um, there is a question here from Susan. Susan, if you want to unmute yourself, please go ahead. Wow, uh, Greg, I'm I'm very. Your paintings are very unique and very. Um, what can I say? They're they're spectacular. I I really I'm really enjoying them. There's they really stand out in a way that um, you can you can sense there's a lot of meaning in there and there's a lot of hidden meaning that you've explained here which I thank you for because I don't know that I would have picked it all out um, but I, I think the explanations have to go with your paintings um, and the story has to go with it because they do tell a story they tell a, def a definite story it's not just a painting of a scene right and and what you bring to it, the colors, your choices of colors and the detail and and the perspective is is just I'm it's moving. It's very moving to to look at it. And I just want to express how I feel about it. So in in doing these, you explain some of it right there with about how you do these grids and things. But I'd like to uh, learn a little bit more about the you know, how you get into the detail that the detail of each thing because there's such there's such detail that mm -hmm. you have included in each element that's in the painting so if you could talk about that i would really appreciate it thank you that's to me is kind of the the icing on the cake sue it's uh i really enjoy the detail in fact when i was younger and and still learning the craft i tended to jump into the detail before i had the big problems resolved so um, I've always enjoyed working with the details. And, and when I'm doing the painting, as I mentioned, I have it uh, more or less resolved on a small scale, but a, how a finger turns or how a foot is planted in the ground or the lighting on a tree, what have you, um, has to be worked out in my, in my mind's eye. And that is done through detailed drawing details. It's really small drawings done independent of the rest of the painting so that I can figure out how the light will hit an object, um, how the form turns, get a three-dimensional feel for it. And I might spend, you know, several hours on just a detail and then I will transplant that to the painting and have it pinned up by the painting so that I can use that information in when I'm actually using a brush on the, on the painting itself. How long would it take you to do how how long did it take you to do that last painting? Uh the looking up painting was a good half a year. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. That's really? right from the that's from the initial, you know, drawings to the finished product, yeah. Beautiful. Thank well you. done. Thank you. Make my day. <laughs> <laughs> you made my All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, there might be a few other questions uh, towards the uh, end of the program, but let's move to Gail, Gail Dempsey. Um, and I'm, I'm going to introduce Gail, and then I'm actually going to um, pass the uh, baton over to Jennifer as well, who is going to show her screen where she has uh, Gail's paintings um, set up for you to see. So Gail Dempsey is, um, she's a fourth generation Muskokan and an award-winning artist who feels a deep connection to the spirit of the land, the lakes, the natural beauty, and the peace that is Muskoka. Capturing the soul of a pl place in acrylic and oil, Gail's work connects with her roots. Loose underpaintings give way to structural details as her passion is revealed. Gail's work has been shown from Muskoka to New York, and in addition to the Propeller Gallery exhibition, she also currently has a solo show at the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto. Gail is passionate about promoting community through the arts. She is a co-founder of Muskoka Chautauqua, and her contributions to the arts in Muskoka 
has received grateful recognition from her community. Okay, Thank you very great. much. Mm -hmm. And hi, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody's faces and names. I mean, some of those people I haven't seen for such a long time. So thanks for coming. Um, I just want to say how honored I am to be sharing in an exhibition with Greg Hindle and the late Dr. Mills. Um, you can put that up if you like, Jennifer. Oh, good. <laughs> it's fine. Thank you. Um, and um, I, I want to mention how our work is as diverse as our standpoints and viewpoints, yet there's an underlying harmony, commonality, and synchronicity. Both Dr. Mills and I studied with Greg, and I was blessed to have spent some time with Dr. Mills and had some exposure to his theosophy, his music, poetry, and his creative encouragement. I'm also grateful to have learned so much from Greg. Thank you, Greg, over the years during his artist residencies in Muskoka, focusing on landscape painting, but also appreciating his narrative point of view. So we could maybe go to Spirit of Truth, which is the first one. Um, I don't spend too much time um, really thinking about uh, narrative type works, but I was really inspired by this one when Jody Wilson Raybould was boldly speaking her truth to power. The painting that emerged is titled Spirit of Truth. The former justice minister and attorney general later wrote a book titled From Where I Stand. As artists, where we stand and our viewpoint are reflected in our work. Where I stand every day, surrounded by the beauty of nature and the spirit of this place, soothes my soul. My work is generally based on the landscape that surrounds me and the spirit of this place, which infuses my being, so that when I step up to the easel with a brush in hand, this essence spills out onto the canvas. I'm always curious where the piece will lead me and what it wants to be. I generally start out with loose underpaintings and try to follow its urges. So we can go to totems one and two, which is an example. Before I do that, Gail, can you just see the the uh, slides now? You don't see everything else on my screen, right? I just see the slides, and I see some um, friendly faces in okay. in along the side. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the winter totem series is an example of this process of the underpainting. Um, I usually, it, at, at this point in time, I was using burnt sienna as the underpainting. It wasn't too different from a number of the group of seven painters. Um, Greg can correct me if I'm wrong, but they used something similar to burnt sienna. It could have been sort of a reddish orange um, as their underpainting. And um, I believe my work has really been influenced by uh, many of the group of seven. I was fortunate to have studied with Pat Fairhead and learned so much about color and form when I first started painting. And Pat passed on to me so much of what she learned from Franklin Carmichael. Um, she learned from Frank Franklin Carmichael about the Munsell color theory. So basically they, they use nine colors um, and which, which I did too for, for many years, Carmichael told Pat Fairhead that it was the closest to light through a prism, those colors. And you rarely, you know, got what they call mud color uh, when mixing those colors together. Um, my studio, which I'm sitting in at the moment, studio and gallery, are in the woods near a waterfall and a river, which flows into a new, nearby lake. It has large windows facing north, east, and west. This is the viewpoint for so many of my pieces in this exhibition, particularly during COVID, when this was my whole world, and the waves of COVID hit and spawned another series, including these last three paintings. This is Winter Blues, Lake Grosso. Standpoint is an attitude or outlook on issues typically arising from one's circumstances or beliefs, whereas viewpoint is one's point of view. 
what has shaped the standpoint and viewpoint from which these paintings have been created? I reflect on the circumstances of my life, particularly the past 10 years. In 2013, my partner Gary was paralyzed by a virus. He was in ICU for two years. We were finally able to get him home on a ventilator. I felt like some of the members of the Group of Seven who painted the casualties of war in Europe from a Canadian perspective over 100 years ago and then came to Northern Ontario to paint. One member said something to the effect that coming to paint in the wilderness was so healing as they walked off the trauma of war as they traversed and painted the landscape here. They noted how the beauty and peace of the wilderness healed their souls. I'm sure painting and writing saved me too over the past decade, and certainly through the pandemic, it was my saving grace. Winter Blues Lake Grosso came out of that time as did River Garden. And then there was COVID and we turned further inward, held by the beauty and peace of our environment. Gary and I often went down to the river to soothe our souls. During that time, as the waves of COVID-19 rose and fell, my work transformed from hard edged dark landscapes to a more fluid and brighter palette. As the waves of numbers of cases and hospitalizations undulated like waves on the water, so did my creative impulses, hopes and fears, sometimes crashing to the shore of my being and sometimes gently washing over me as I translated that moment in time to canvas. This never ending movement towards the next pushed me forward as I looked to new ways of living, creating and showing up. She Flies On is the next piece. The rise and fall of the waves, the ebbs and peaks, and the bombardment of our being with information and disinformation and uncertainty created its own rhythm of paint on canvas and paper. A rhythm in place free of rules and restrictions. A greater vision of life. And... Um, so I was really quite surprised, actually, how that happened, because it seemed um, pretty rocky there. But but somehow there was this gentle uh, motion that became a, a beautiful rhythm for painting. Um, I think that was pretty much all I wanted to say about the pieces. But subsequent to COVID and most recently, we did have quite a bit of firsthand information about the war in the Ukraine. And we did have, um, well, actually 10 Ukrainians staying with us for a period of time. So we got some, some um, firsthand insights, uh, not so much you know, about their own country and the war, but about our country and the peace here and how, you know, they talked about how, how we had such a wow life here. And we were so glad that we were able to host them because, um, well, they're having a wow life here now too, which is, which is great. Uh, eight of them and four of them um, have moved on to uh, Egypt. But while they were here, they painted with us and we had music and live music in the gallery. And um, I really, you know, feel that the arts are are such a a universal healing medium, and you know, not subject to language barriers. Um, and uh, I, I'm just grateful, you know, to have that opportunity in my life to to create in that way. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Gail. I just want to say that was beautiful. Um, I was blessed to stop in at your gallery as you were painting um, on my way home a few weeks ago and uh, one of these paintings. And I just, I was so moved. It was so um, enlivening just to visit your space. And it presents a, a, a real hope 
for the world, what you're doing, your painting and your expression in it just uh, really is, um, you're giving people hope like the, uh, the Ukrainians who popped into your home. I'm glad I got to briefly see them as I was leaving. So thank you so much for all you're doing because these works are um, a blessing to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, Gail, there's a couple of comments in, in the chat, which I'd like to share with you. They're okay. not, not actually questions, but um, Terry Stevens says, thank you for telling your story and how you navigated the experience of your life and circumstances in such a powerful way. And Nancy McHardy said, um, beautiful work, Gail. I really like your signature, too. And <laughs> And um, is it Hoffman? I think you told us before, Anne. Um, you say Anne is from uh, Holly, <coughs> from Amsterdam. And uh, Anne said, I love your work, Gail, and your spirit in capital letters. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I did have a question uh, here from someone else, uh, Jennifer. Shall I go ahead and ask, or did you want to take over the reins? Ask away, Macduff. Ask away. So um, this was a question that came earlier um, about your palate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you mentioned that um, your COVID pictures don't have a lot of color. And um, are you using... Uh, different colors has your use of color changed since covid eased since covid eased okay well going into covid i think i was still primarily using the munsell colors which if i can remember correctly is um cadmium red cadmium yellow lemon yellow cranacrinum magenta uh, burnt sienna yellow okra um, phthalo blue, phthalo green, and I don't know, maybe white as the other one. Um, during the COVID period, I, I've always really loved Payne's Gray. It has, a, it's so versatile and it has such a, a blue undertone. And so um, I just started with Payne's Gray and white. And then um, I wanted to add, I really had to explore blues. I just couldn't seem to find, you know, a blue that was really satisfying. I experimented with every kind of blue I could find. Now, I did, I have my paints right here beside me in the gallery. And this is cerulean deep blue. There is cerulean blue, cerulean deep blue and cerulean um, chromium. I, I wasn't familiar with all those uh, flavors, but I've been experimenting with them and I've been really enjoying them in, during the COVID paintings. And then um, with all of that soft color, of course I had to throw in a, a Greg Hindle zinger or two, which I did with um, pyrrole orange, and CP camp cadmium red light, just a hint. But um, as we were coming out of um, COVID days, uh, the, these were my, my main colors. And I mean, these were big zinger pieces. My most recent ones are five, six feet, and they have a lot of zinger colors in them and a lot of light, a lot of, um, hope and they just wanted to be some kind of um, message about how we are coming into this time of so much more light and hope and uh, I was just grateful to be able to paint those great thank you Gail I'm going to uh, turn the baton back to Jennifer who is going to share with us her experience of being with Dr. Mills and of his work. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much, Katrine. Gail, uh, Greg, 
we'll speak in order. Greg and Gail, thank you very much for what you've shared. Um, it's both so different, such different artists and such inspiring messages from both of you. Thank you. Uh, let's see now. I have something here on... Everybody give me a moment here while I persuade word that it really isn't Gail's slide, but my, what I want to say. Okay. Okay. I think you all can see me. Yes. Good. So what I'll do for about four minutes, if you bear with me, is to speak a bit about the artist, Kenneth G. Mills. And then after that, we'll look at his slides and um, hopefully engage in some question and answer. So to call Kenneth G. Mills, quote unquote, artist, is perhaps an oversimplification of his story. And I wanted to bring out some of the other facets of this um, gentleman's being. So I sat down to write to prepare for this afternoon and I turned to the foreword of a wonderful book that are his memoirs called Can The Candy Maker's Son. And a foreword there was written by a gentleman who won 11 Emmy, Award, uh, Emmy Awards, who was a news anchorman, who is a news anchorman and poet, Roland, Roland G. Smith. And he wrote, it's a daunting task to presume to write a foreword to the memoirs of Kenneth G. Mills. The word unique comes to mind quickly as I think of his numerous accomplishments as musician, teacher, philosopher, composer, artist, designer, and poet. For one to be so many things, he has to be extraordinary, has to be gifted, has to be blessed. He has to be an old soul whose spirit is in harmony with the angelic realms of creation. I'll just add as a little aside that I highly recommend this book for any of you who aren't familiar with it. And should you wish a copy of it, please do contact the Kenneth G. Mills Foundation. You can do that through the kgmffoundation.org. And um, there you'll also learn more about this wonderful gentleman. Dr. Mills studied piano for 25 years achieving recognition, um, uh, achieving a wide recognition as his high accomplishments as a concert pianist and one of the foremost teachers in Canada. He always called art his hobby. And when asked how painting appeared to come to him as so simply and spontaneously he acknowledged the discipline he had gained through his years of intensive study. Technique, he once said, is nothing but self-discipline, self-mastery. The purpose of technique is to enable the obstruction of mediumship to fade out. One goes from with the source <laughs> from which all music itself springs. That is why you practice technique. As we learned from Greg today, his technique is flawless. It is to become so fluent that the music is free to have its course. In one conversation about his paintings, Dr. Mills remarked, so my music, as I see now, was my means of discipline. It was my means of perceiving how the functions of my fingers and my thoughts and my attention were all the result of my intention. 
my intention was allow the, to allow the music to be heard without being in the way as a performer. That is why I strove to develop such a technique that when I performed, anything I did would seem so simple. And as one watched Dr. Mills paint, that simplicity and fluidity of expression certainly appeared to flow through his brush onto brilliant canvases. As we look through the following paintings, we will look at the elements of the work, such as use of color, texture, direction, and speed of brush strokes. We will focus on the importance of negative space or the spaces between things. Most importantly, perhaps, we will focus on the element of surprise. According to my Funk and Wagnalls, surprise means to cause to feel wonder or astonishment because unusual or unexpected. When I read that definition, it seemed to me to be a correlation to a comment made by a wonderful Canadian painter by the name of Timothy Phillips. Mr. Phillips was a student of and assistant to Salvador yeah. Dali, and he was a great admirer of Dr. Mill's paintings. He once commented how he loved how the work was full of metaphysical hints hidden there the way Dolly hides them. So I'm hoping that we can explore this work and find it, find the surprises there. And then perhaps through our astonishment, we will discern a metaphysical hint. Perhaps then we will feel the vibration of the source from which all music, indeed all art, springs. So these, this painting is actually right here in the gallery in the center of one of the walls, which um, Gwen showed us earlier. It's called um, White, Green and White Calla Lilies. It's acrylic on canvas and 48 by 48. I thought perhaps this painting may be a good way to speak about speed and direction of brush strokes because of the rapidity at which this center element of the painting, which is coming from the calla lilies center there, almost right in the center of the canvas, moving up toward us very, very quickly towards the upper right-hand corner of the in a ver uh, horizontal movement to the upper right hand corner. This and the flow of the arc that's extending out along the edge of the petal is really giving us a sense, or at least it gives me a sense of um, incredible rapidity as well as a very high energy. I love too the negative or black spaces in this painting as we look in between these um, petal, these leaves, which are so delicately and intriguingly outlined in white, we're seeing some very beautiful shapes, which in themselves are leading and quite beautiful. For instance, if you look at the white calla lily that's just pointing off to the right of the canvas at the right hand, at the bottom there on the right, you travel up into a just a, a negative space. Um, Dr. Mills painted on black uh, gessoed canvases. So that's actually the black gessoed canvas you see there. And that space leads you both off the canvas to the right, as well as a flowing way along the top of those leaves that it goes between into the center, where we open up into sort of almost a... I don't know how to describe that shape. It's like the opening of something and rests against the very vibrant white edge of the um, 
the petal or the it's actually a white leaf of the calla lily, I think, uh, as it curves down gently and then points back down with a little tiny whoop at the bottom of it, back down to the right corner of the canvas. I'm going to move on to the next painting here. I included this painting, it was a bit of a cheat because it's not really in the show, but Glenn Noble spoke about a bee's perspective and I would like to share an experience I had with this painting. Frankly, when I first saw this painting and for quite a while afterwards, it really bothered me. I could not get over the thickness and the strength at the edge of these um, this is a crocus. The name of the painting is Spring Promise, and it's acrylic on canvas. And we have these very, very de defined edges of these crocuses that have seeming weight and dimension all of their own. And it just did, this did not correspond to my view of the pretty spring crocus and the delicate flowers in the garden. And then with these vibrant stripes, stripes and everything, and then this big petal down in the bottom, both bottom right and bottom left, I, I just, I, I couldn't see it. I Every time I saw this painting, I, I was, it bugged me, it bothered me. So one day I said to myself, you've got to find out why this painting is bothering you, Jennifer. And I really sat down and allowed myself just to enter that feeling of disquiet and also to really just look. And all of a sudden, it came into focus that this painting could very well be painted from the perspective not of the human, but of the bee. And what we see here is a flower as we're diving in it to gather the nectar, to take to our hive, to share with our community. And a wonderful poem that Dr. Mills gave spontaneously that was set to music by a group of singers called the Starscape Singers and sung all throughout Europe and Russia, seven times in Carnegie Hall, called The Bee came to mind, and in it, there's a wonderful line, why aren't you more like the bee? And I then, from that moment on, have adored this painting. This painting is called Wild, let me make sure because, <clears throat> Wild Red Parrot Tulip. It's acrylic on canvas. It's 36 by 30 inches. And perhaps instead of, oh, I will actually point out a few things. <clears throat> Not long ago, I had the privilege of speaking to an artist who is based uh, for many years in Tennessee and is now down in Mexico named Bernice Davidson, an artist I've known since I was a young girl in Philadelphia. She attended the Philadelphia College of Art and then went on to get her master's, her master's of fine art from Yale University. And she and I had a wonderful exploration of Dr. Mills's paintings together. And at one point she spoke of the star-like use of very, very delicate dots of, dots of white. And I do see an example of this. If you start at the petal, at the upper right corner, that the petal that's just going off the edge of the canvas there, and you follow it, um, it has brush strokes that are leading you down to, to where it's resting on the leaf, you'll see a tiny trail of white, white light perhaps, a glimmer of light. And it's sort of leading you back towards, almost behind 
but also to the center of the flower that is right in the center and featured in this painting. And Bernice spoke about the importance of those, that kind of use of very subtle, very delicate detail and how it was really um, giving a, a, a message to um, of the whole painting. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. I'm going to be quiet for a moment and just allow you to um, a few minutes of quiet with this painting. Thank you. So before we move on, <clears throat> I'm wondering if any of you may have found an element of surprise in this painting. It's not a leading question. I can't say that I know where there's an element of surprise here. I'm just wondering if maybe one of you discovered something. Please uh, feel free to share it in the chat. If not, we'll uh, move forward and maybe come back to this one. This is in the gallery. It's on the north wall that Glenn showed to us. This painting is called Full Grown Rose, Full Blown Rose, sorry. It too is acrylic on canvas and it's 30 by 36. As one watched Dr. Mills paint, which many, there are many actually on the call who had the privilege of doing that. I'm, I'm one, um, it was, always remarkable to watch the um, the authority with which he approached the canvas which you was demonstrated in a very very sure and rhythmic brush stroke dr mills especially in these paintings which are fairly early in his painting career um were a delight and surprise to Dr. Mills. It, he, he, um, he loved painting and he found it a great, great, great joy. <clears throat> I remember one experience when I was watching him paint and um, he was painting a tulip and he stopped for a minute and the painting, the, the, bouquet that he was painting was actually some steps away from him. So he put down his brush and he walked over and he peered right into the tulip. And then on his way back to his canvas, he said, I don't know why I look at it. It's not there. And I remember piping up, Dr. Mills, if you didn't look at it and give it your attention, it would feel sad because it loves attention. And he said, that's it. <laughs> so there was definitely an, an element of wonder and discovery. And perhaps we could say something that was going beyond the scene, beyond what was seen with the eyes as Dr. Mills painted. This painting, appropriately close to the fire of Greg's uh, painting that we saw earlier, is um, called Orange Fire. And I think, again, we can see here some of the very delicate use of white. I love the way the um, light source 
of Dr. Mills' flowers seem to frequently mostly come from the flowers themselves. I love the uh, rhythm of these shapes and how they're all fitting together as they do. And although the leaves are all in the background and seemingly um, not as primary as the flower itself, the shapes of the leaves and the weight of some of them, the direction, how some of them are quite um, hard edged and while others are softer and seemingly drooping, not drooping, but but bowing down towards towards the flower. If you see that on the paint, the flowers, the leaves, I'm sorry, the leaves on the upper left there. All these um, movements and shapes of the leaves are very, very important to this overall composition. I promised you a bit of talk about surprise. I think we have something on the chat. Let me check. Yes, we have a comment that the flowers come right off the canvas, alive, vibrant, and seemingly multidimensional. Thank you for that, Susan. Um, the That is so true of Dr. Mills' work. And, and frequently um, when I was with Dr. Mills and we were looking at his work, I would remark that the painting itself appeared to start about three feet before you actually got to the canvas. People frequently remarked about George O'Keefe when looking at Dr. Mills's florals because they too, like George O'Keefe's florals. They're very, very large. The flower is really magnified and becomes, you know, the all important subject in the painting. And when Dr. Mills and I were talking about that one day, um, I told him that while George O'Keefe has always been a hero of mine as a as a artist from the female race, <laughs> her daring to be an artist was really a uh, a way shore to for certainly for me um, that there was a big difference. I found a big difference between Dr. Mills's florals and George O'Keefe. And that had come from a trip I had taken to an O'Keefe retrospective that was at the Mo Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And I was very surprised as I looked at the work that it seemed to be very much on the surface of the canvas. I didn't feel much depth, whereas, or didn't perceive much depth in, in her paintings. And um, it just is something that stood out to me in my response to that show. And I shared that with Dr. Mills and in the particular painting we were looking at had the smallest red dot. Unfortunately, I don't have it to show you. It was an orange dot beside one of the flowers. It was the size of a number two brush or something. It was very, very small. And I pointed to it and I said, for instance, that dot gives this painting dimension. And he said, I put that dot there in order to give it dimension. And depth, tremendous depth. Now, as I was started earlier, I had promised a bit about surprise, and I think this painting gives an example of what I meant. And it is found in my perception, these are my understanding and responses to these paintings, um, that I can find an element of surprise if we go to the very top left-hand corner. And we have two, two, well, are they buds? Yes, you could call them buds, but are they really buds? They're almost like beings, little something or others. They're a slightly different red, a slightly different palette than the rest of the canvas, even slightly different palette than the 
lower uh, the little florals that are at the very bottom, sort of dancing along the bottom of this picture. And one is coming into the canvas from the left, and then the other appears to be going off the canvas, sort of at the top, but off a little bit, pointing a little bit left. And that's the kind of element in this painting that really makes me question, ask questions. What is that? Why is that there? What is it pointing to? Do I really know what I'm looking at? Can I make any assumptions? What assumptions am I making about these paintings? So that's what I mean when I speak about surprise. I have another comment here. The capture of white light and the vibrant orange and the flaming exploding into the buoyancy of the piece. Thank you. We'll move on. And this is called, I have to look at my notes because of slight nervousness that makes me forget everything. Okay, prickly pear blossoms. It's acrylic on canvas and it's 30 by 36. I confess that this is one of my favorite paintings of Dr. Mills <clears throat> for many reasons. And perhaps um, we, of course, have these gorgeous, gorgeous blossoms that are moving so quickly, again with the rhythm and sure, sureness of stroke, of brush stroke, again with beautiful negative spaces, gorgeous edges that lead us around and into and out, back out and around and into this, these flowers. And then these delightful prickles of the cat cactus all around it. Anyone who spent time in the desert will probably see this slightly differently. If you've had any close encounters with the cactus, which some of us have, <laughs> they may make you giggle. They make me giggle. And I love their, their vibrancy. They almost appear to be floating underwater they almost appear to be alive extraterrestrials cheerful beings talking to us so um i think that's everything i have to say except that if oh a chat i love these chats also if you want to just pipe up and say something please do <laughs> We have a chat from someone, I believe, who's in New York, who says, the blossoms are ballet of light. <laughs> Feel free to speak up, too, if you want. I'm, you're a very quiet audience. I appreciate that, too. But I'll, I'll point out that that one red area is an element of surprise. Actually, speaking of talking, Greg Hindle. If I may, I'd love to call on you. Sure. Um, because you had the privilege of actually, and the pleasure, I believe, from everything I've learned from you, of actually working with Dr. Mills to teach him technique and to help him with his work. And I'm wondering if you would like to speak about that a little bit, if you could, what it was like to be Dr. Mills's teacher, painting teacher. Well, it was 20 years ago now, and maybe, maybe I'll give or stop take. sharing so we can see your face. There. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, and uh, he was living in Palgrave at the time. I was about, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes north of him in Loretto, still am. And it was through the, uh, the Diedrichs that um, I got to know Dr. Mills. They invited me to come over for sort of a group lesson. It was uh, them and uh, Dr. Mills and his assistant, was it uh, David or, yeah. And um, it was a pretty amazing experience. So, um, I had never really uh, dealt with uh, a, a personality quite, quite like Dr. Mills. I, I remember being in, ushered into his house by the, the butler and, 
being kind of lost as I went through the house because it was just a visual feast everywhere you went. I, I could, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to find my way out if I wasn't escorted. <laughs> but the, the actual lessons themselves were, were a real hoot. They were so much fun. He was such a, uh, an engaging and, and delightful person to work with. He, he was so open-minded and, and um, he, he was just soaking it all in like a sponge with almost like a childlike quality of wonder and, and excitement of, of discovering anything that came out of my mouth. It was just went straight to his, straight to his brush and straight to the painting. And it was a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. The, uh, the, the paintings that he came up with while I was there were mostly just um, uh, exercises. Uh, so we, uh, we never really worked on anything as a finished painting, but uh, yeah, he had a, he had a great time. I had I a great time. Sorry. Go ahead. I remember, I, I recall one time when you were, you were speaking about how Dr. Mills was saying, well, it isn't working. Why is it working? Can you tell us about that? And you said, use a little, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to refresh you, me. There's a lot of stuff. Well, I remember at the time you were saying that you, he was such an incredible student and so eager to learn. Yes. And yeah. And which really, um, and that, <laughs> and what I remembered you saying was that he would say, it's not working, Greg. Why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? And you said, use a little blue. And, and, he, and so I don't know if that sparks for you some memories of, of more stories of the actual specifics of getting the paint down, but... <laughs> Well, I, I yeah, I remember that like the, this um, eagerness and childlike quality again of his mm -hmm. was was rather unique. And I remember him uh, there; they'd be sharing a pallet, so there'd be like one pallet between the two of them, and and they they'd be constantly arguing. You took my red. You took my red. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful. No, I just say squirt more red, but he took <laughs> my red. <laughs> Oh, wow. Anyway, thank you all. I'm wondering if anyone, um, anybody else have anything they would like to um, share and offer? Let me, yeah, we have about 20 minutes. I actually, we do have a little treat for you for at the very end. Um, Katrine, I'm still sort of holding the floor here, but I'll give it back in a minute. Um, but um we we have a, a treat at the end that we can um, we can share with you for about the last eight minutes of the call I think but meanwhile we're really um, we just have some free time here so Jennifer yes yeah I want to point out cataract of light is a detail of the orange fire the cover of cataract cataract of light. Thank you for sharing that. This is a book that's uh, available. It's a book of Dr. Mills's unfoldments, spun, which were all spontaneously given. Um, I haven't really talked uh, uh, much about that aspect of Dr. Mills' career. Um, so let's see if I can encapsulate it for you. Um, Dr. Mills had always considered uh, questions uh, very, very deeply, of uh, very important questions deeply of his entire uh, during his his you know childhood and growing up. Uh, the most important of which was what is soul, which was a question that he asked uh, very intensely from when he was a very, very young child, and he asked it for. 20, over 25 years, 30 years. And it was this kind of questioning, of course, as, as such questioning does, that led to many insights and inner, inner awarenesses. And at one point, um, he received actually a message that came through various sources that he should learn to speak the word again, that words are important. 
you must learn to speak the word again. So while he didn't know what that meant, he did accept the message and um, considered what it pondered, you know, considered its meaning and then came to an inner agreement that if asked, he would speak about his experiences. And shortly after that, a phone, he was approached, the phone rang, literally, and he was asked to speak. And that launched a career, um, hit a new career, no longer a, a musical career, so much as a career of speaking. And over the next 30 years, he spoke to thousands and thousands. He was named the 1997 Prime Mentor of Canada. And because he had was a mentor to many thousands of people literally all over the world and um, was given uh, in 1998 a recognition award from the Senate of Canada for his um, achievements in the humanity, his achievement and contribution to the humanities and the arts. So the book that Glenn Noble just held up is a book of his lectures, which he called Unfoldments, which were all spontaneously given and um, always spoke to questions, both frequently unheard, unasked questions, but inner questions um, within the audience, frequently speaking to audiences of hundreds of people. And these lectures have been captured, were captured on tape and subsequently transcribed and are now published in the book. And the book is available on Amazon and through the Kenneth G. Mills Foundation website, as well as many other books that are there. There are seven poetry, prose books and all. So thank you, Glenn. Jennifer, if I could just yes. I could just add one tiny. Thank you. Here, which I think is kind of unique given the context of our program here. When Dr. Mills did make that vow that he would only speak if he were asked, ironically, the very first person who asked that phone call that came to him was from a visual artist who did not ask him about life. He didn't ask him about spirituality. He asked about his painting and could he come <laughs> and assess his painting. Do you remember that? Yes, very well. And in his memoirs, Dr. Mills relates that his first response to that was, but I don't know anything about art. And yes. then he remembered his vow and said, yes, come. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just want to thank you. Oh, Terry, did you want to say something? Yes. I uh, had an experience in Tucson, Arizona with Dr. Mills. I was there on a sabbatical with the Starscape Singers, and Dr. Mills started to paint a painting one morning. It's called Magic Desert. And I commented on it. I said, wow, I said, there's such a detail and so dramatic on the lower half of the painting, of which he did in the morning. And he said, oh, that's nothing. Wait till you see the clouds. Wait till you see the sky. I thought, what's he talking about? So that evening, he continued to the painting, painting the sky and these dramatic clouds, which to me looked like a Viking ship. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I didn't say it out loud, but I thought, you would never see that in nature. And about a week later, I looked up in the Tucson sky, and there was that cloud. <laughs> it was so close to what he had painted. I was just amazed. Amazing. And one other acknowledgement I would like to give is to uh, Greg Hindel. And uh, Tish and I both studied with him for, uh, um, I don't know how many lessons, maybe uh, a dozen, and he would come to our house 
and we would put our paintings on the mantle. And then he would sit there with a glass of tea and comment on the paintings and say, oh, you could, could do this, try this color, try this shape. No, no, don't do that. A river doesn't go uphill unless it's a <laughs> waterfall. <laughs> Some basic instruction. I was just learning. Tish was ahead of me. But he was such an inspired and is an inspired teacher. One of the best I've ever witnessed. And I had one painting of a tree and a river. And he said, you see this square inch of the painting? I said, yes. He said, that is museum quality. <laughs> and you can imagine as a, a, a beginning artist to have someone say that to you. And he said, do you know why that is? I said, because of the contrast? He said, exactly. So I thank you, Greg. I've learned so much from you, and I still, to this day, use it in every painting I do, everything you taught me. Oh, thanks a lot. It's great to hear and great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Well, thank you, Terry. And um, I just had noticed in the chat another acknowledgement of Greg. Um, this is from Nancy McCarty. Thank you, Greg. I am so impressed with your descriptions of your paintings. And I'm extremely proud to be a member of the Gibson and your mentorship. Well, thank you, Nancy. And then Nancy also says later, beautiful work, Gail. I really like your signature too. I hope you don't mind my reading this. I just know from um, having done many, many Zoom calls that um, even though the chats are available for everybody, often if you're presenting or if you're talking, you somehow don't get to the chats. So that's why I'm taking the liberty of actually reading them. Um, and then Nancy also says, um, I was just going to mention the surprise splash of red behind the one flower. And then Nancy says, can we watch the re this recording at another time? And how can we access this again? So yes, we have recorded it. Um, we're not sure exactly what we're going to do with it. Hopefully, we can actually put it up on the website once we've done a little bit of editing to get, you know, the technological issues out. Um, but uh, this has been a very, very rich conversation and experience. And um, it would be wonderful to rehear it and to see it again. Um, I want to thank... Um, all the participants, um, I, I, and I'm referring, of course, to uh, Jennifer and Greg and Gail and Glenn, and also um, those of you who have taken the time today to join us. Um, I do want to let you know, if you didn't have a chance to see the show live, you can still go down this afternoon. Um, and then tomorrow, Sunday, uh, the gallery will close at 5.30 and after 5.30, the show actually will come down. However, it is a traveling show, and it will be shown again at the Gibson Cultural Centre in Alliston, Ontario. Um, and could somebody please give me the date, because I don't have that date. And I think it's the end of April. It opens on April, the last... Yeah, April 29th. Uh, all right, April 29th. So you're welcome to come to Alliston, and see the show, and I think Glenn has. I think said, the opening is sorry. I think the opening is uh, from two to four p.m. on the 29th. Great, and it'll be up for what? How long? Two weeks? Three weeks? A month. A month. Yeah. And as as Glenn said earlier, I think there's going to be more more paintings because it's yes, a big... it's a larger space. Yeah. Okay. So we have one more treat for you, um, and this is a video, um, and I'm going to play it in a few minutes. And when the video has finished, I am going to um, close the Zoom. So this is your last opportunity to say anything if you wish. You don't have to put your hand. Okay, Mary Joy, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I'd like to thank Gail Dempsey, actually, for introducing me to the deeper experience of Dr. Mills' painting. She 
uh, some years ago at her studio had a number of Dr. Mills paintings up on the walls for a brief showing. Uh, it was during one of our summer festivals in Muskoka, and a number of us came to her gallery and, and looked at his paintings, and that was where I had my first real encounter with orange fire and uh, had an experience of sort of an energy exchange happening, and it, it was a wonderful experience, and I also was delighted to meet Gail, and I'm very interested in Gail in your current series of paintings that are in your um, uh, solo show at the Arts and Letters uh, about what's the name exactly? It's the wave, something, the wave. The waves cometh. And yes. if you go to the Arts and Letters website on the home page, you can just click on Gail Dempsey solo show and see the works there. Good. Thank you. And Greg, you too. I, I don't know as much about uh, your work. I learned a lot today. I appreciate that. And one piece that I have seen that moved me so deeply, it's it's a private piece, I guess, but where you paint, uh, drew Dr. Mills and some other, uh, what would we call them, characters? Um, in a very beautiful way, and the expression that you captured on Dr. Mills' face was so special. Uh, I'm I'm just so in appreciation of the way you were able to capture that, oh. and uh, it's it's kind of a expression of happiness that I didn't always see on his face, but part of perhaps of that childlikeness. So I feel that I do have the triangle here of all three in, in some way. And I'm most grateful to both of you, Greg and Gail, for uh, giving us your beautiful work and allowing us to come into your worlds a bit, as well as our uh, knowing Dr. Mill's work and his world. So it's it's a wonderful triumvirate, and I'm most grateful that this uh, exhibition happened. Well, thank you very much. We're we're yeah, we're quite a team. <laughs> we are. Thank you, thank you all, thank you, Mary Joy. I think now, Judith. 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 Yes, I, I would like to just mostly say thank you. I want you to, I, I just was so moved by how the show was put together as well. Yes. Because there is something about all the different perspectives and how they harmonized because of the artistry of those, maybe the curator and, and the people that put it together. But I found that amazing that you can have so many different perspectives and it all gels in such a way that you you realize that all the perspectives are so unique and so profoundly moving when you spend time looking at them. So thank you, thank you, thank you.